Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hey, and welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. I have got an incredible story for you guys today. It is the story of one Chris Duffin. Some of you may know of him as the mad scientist Duffin or the owner of Kabuki Strength, the one that deadlifted a thousand pounds for a double. This guy has one of the most incredible stories of any human being I've ever heard of, to be honest. He grew up living in Northern California in the mountains, completely off the grid. He would bounce around. He spent some time in foster care. He would bounce around for years in the mountains, living just about as poor of a life as possible in, um, in America. <clears throat> um, he encountered murderers, rapists, even a pedophile ring in the mountains of Central Oregon. He ended up raising his sisters when he was just entering college. And against all of these odds stacked against him, he became the valedictorian of his high school, the top engineer in his college. He became a very successful corporate executive doing company turnarounds. He became the only man in history to deadlift a thousand pounds, not only for a single, but for a double. And he has some incredible other feats of strength. He's one of the best power lifters of, of all time as well. And he's currently the owner of a company called Kabuki Strength, which is at the cutting edge of the strength world. This is going to be a two-part episode. The first is about his story. It is fascinating. And then after that, we're going to dive into strength sports, the science behind what they do, what it takes to become a world champion, and all that good stuff. Guys, I hope you enjoy the show. Before we get started... If you would, and you haven't done so already, please head to iTunes, leave me a quick review, share this with a friend, hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Chris Duffin, what's up, brother? How are you? I'm doing good. Great to talk to you today. Dude, great to finally meet you, man. Uh, you know, we, we, we've talked about this a couple times. When we first got introduced, the, the guy that introduced us, Kevin, he sent me over this long kind of story about you and it but the first part of the story was like this little paragraph about you that was kind of just a synopsis and all I did in the beginning was look at the synopsis and I didn't look any further and so I knew you were you know cool enough to come on the show but then as I was preparing for this I actually read the entire thing and I had fucking goosebumps man you have one of the most incredible stories of anyone that's ever been on this show and really of anyone that I've ever heard. And you've gone through you've gone through so much in your life and have gotten so much success. And so I'm really just excited to dive into this. And uh, just for the, the listeners, we're going to do two parts because I think there's just too much to discuss in one show. We're going to do one part on Chris's story and another on business and strength and all of that kind of stuff. So, dude, I'm, I'm just excited that you joined me today. Yeah, excited to dive into this. Like I've I've had to learn to share my story um, because it's something I kept uh, pretty close to me uh, when I was younger. But like the, I've as I've shared it, it's had such a huge impact on people. And obviously it's been a big piece in creating who I am today, the philosophies that I live by and the things that I promote. Um, and, uh, it's good for people to, to know the background of that. And, you know, I just think, you know, as, before we jump into it, you don't have to have a crazy story to have, you know, huge success in strength training business and all that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, it, it's, it's conscious choice. And so it, before we dive into, it, I just like to give the preemptive thing that, this story is something that shows you if you if you take responsibility for your life and who you are and who you want to become who you choose to become that you can you can you can achieve that despite any number of circumstances or environment that you live in and that's a big thing because a lot of times you ask people you know hey you know who are you or you know and and they'll tell you a story 
a story mm-hmm. about who they, you know, their circumstances and why what's happened to them to create create this situation. And uh, I say bullshit to that. Like you choose who you are. You know, those are environmental things and the stuff around that you can that you have to deal with. But that is not a definition of who you are. You can let it be, but it's not. So, so it's just important to understand that before you jump into the, we jump into the story going, well, I, I just haven't had anything like that to shape me. No, this is actually showing how far you can come from and what you can actually accomplish. Uh, right. Given, given very difficult circumstances and has nothing yeah, to wh- do with like, you know, what I've actually achieved personally right. as an output of that. You're casting a really, really wide net here because you're what you're really saying is that if I can achieve this and, and, you know, not to be cliche, but if someone that's gone through as much as I've gone through can accomplish what I have, then, some, you know, the average Joe or Jane absolutely can. And it's just a choice. It is. It is a choice. And that's it's down to, yeah, basically deciding who you want to be and planning the path to to get there and executing you know right um yeah a lot of people like to be dreamers but uh uh that's a pretty incomplete thing in my in my idea you've got to be a visionary you've got to create the vision of all the steps along the way the dirt the treasury the struggle the like all those sorts of things it's if you're just seeing that big picture at the end is this bright light like that's <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Exactly. <laughs> You've got to have a vision of every, everything between now and then in the 20, 30 years that it may take to get there. Right. Yeah. Badass, man. So when, when is the first time that you remember being conscious of the fact that you weren't having a normal upbringing, normal childhood? Um, that, that's, that's a little tough uh, because it probably... Uh, took a long time for all of it really to settle in. But I, you know, when I was, oh, it was about five or six years old, I was living in the mountains in Northern California. And uh, we had kind of a, a homestead situation going on. We, we, there's this, you know, we're up on this dirt road. There's actually literally no roads, final roads to even get into the home that we're out and no electricity, no running water, nothing like that. Just uh, pretty, pretty basic stuff. And uh, me and my my friend, who's the same age as me, we would sit out at night. We'd go out and we'd go up to the edge of the ridge, and we'd climb up on this big rock and we'd look out. Uh, we'd look out in the distance at the valleys and uh, and your five year old friend. Yeah, and we'd see, you know, all the lights of the city off in the uh, off in the distance. And I would just sit there and, you know wonder what what it was like like what that what that life was what was out there because we were completely separated it was just you know the couple families that lived in this home in the mountains living off you know trying to trying to make do and um that was you know the first realization that there was some sort of separation from some you know normal society out there and i didn't even know what it was and honestly it was uh, knowing now, I'm like, wow, that's a that was a town. This big giant town in the distance with all the lights fluttering was like a town of like five thousand people or something. So, but that was uh, you know metropolis. something in metropolis exactly. And uh, yeah, I, and, and through the years, you know, I definitely I don't know when that transition really happened, but uh, it was a struggle a long time for me growing up, just knowing. You know, when I was in school and things like that, like making connections with other people when, you know, I'm going home to a, you know, a tent or maybe a little tiny trailer down by the river, you know, <laughs> but really <laughs> not the joke, Literally. Kind, but yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and just, you know, having that in the background of your head and going, I can't really fit in with, you know, everybody else. And it definitely tempered uh, my ability growing up to really establish strong connections until I was you know, uh, a little bit older. Mm-hmm. So what, what, what else was going on? What, what, what was your, what was your family structure like? How was your relationship with your parents? Um, what was it like growing up? Yeah. So I had, uh, three younger sisters and one younger brother. And, um, so we moved around a lot of Northern California, uh, a lot of times just living in the mountains, 
Um, during the school year, sometimes we'd get some, you know, a, uh, a cabin or <laughs> a condemned house uh, that we would uh, that we would that we would move down into, so I could get to and from school. Uh, my siblings weren't in school yet. I was quite a bit uh, older than than all the other uh, than my brother and my my sisters, and we would do, you know, poach animals, uh, kill lots of. I mean. Fish. Uh, when I was growing up, I would I would go out and fish all day long for dinner. I'd catch grasshoppers first. Uh, we foraged for mushrooms, and just a lot of things that people like don't think about. Like, how do you do that? How do you bathe? How do you do things? You know. So it was like you'd walk. You we'd drive down to the you know to the stream and fill up our empty gallon m- milk jugs with water, take them up and put them out on a rock in the sun and let them sit out all day and then you dump it over your head like and that's that's how you deal with those sorts of things and uh so it was <clears throat> it was definitely different and it's really interesting cuz it's just a different kind of poor than a lot of what you see today as poor um mm-hmm. because you see people oh I'm poor but they've got nice clothes they've got their cell phones and like it was a family of six living on like $5000 a year you know, definitely less than ten thousand dollars a year, I, and people don't realize like just how little that is. You know, like I, I never once as a child ever even had, n- let alone never never ate in a restaurant. Certainly, never had fast mm-hmm. food. Like these were just not options. You know, we'd go to you know the Salvation Army and I'd get a used pair of shoes, and then I'd wear it for the next couple years until my feet were sticking out the sides. You know, that's the that's the that's the type of you know life that we had. I mean there just wasn't anything mm-hmm. uh, I mean I, I remember one winter this is in Northern California and uh, we had nothing but uh, uh, a big 50 pound sack of rice and a big 50 pound sack of beans and we me and the the kids we, I remember our parents were would feed us meat they weren't eating any meat themselves they literally just ate rice and beans and i just watched them over the course of that winter just like shrink you know because they just weren't getting the nutrition uh that, wow. that they should and it's just yeah it's just a it's just a it's a different life and so it was uh uh when i was in second grade or after second grade um the, the state we were we were living in the mountains up in uh, northern uh, California, kind of between uh, Humboldt and uh, Trinity County areas. And for anybody that's in the, the California region, mm-hmm. um, but uh, out in the mountain ranges out there, uh, we had a bunch of tents. We're just living living up there, and the state came in and uh, uh, they they took my took took all of us kids and put us into uh, to foster care. And that was a that was a pretty challenging, pretty challenging time. Um, so we all spent a, a year there before uh, parents were able to uh, to to get us back, and we ended up up in uh, up in Oregon at the time. And my we never got my brother back. So um, which isn't wow. He had a different why. He, he had a different father, and uh, his father ended up taking him uh, from the state, and then he got uh, got custody. Um, yeah, probably via some unethical means, but, uh, mm-hmm. and actually ended up being pretty unfortunate for my brother. But, um, so it was just me and, uh, me and my sisters and we ended up kind of living pretty much. Sim- I mean, we, um, ended up regressing back into the, like the first, uh, first year we, ha- we had a home and it was good. Um, and then pretty quickly that fell apart and we ended up out in Eastern Oregon. Same thing. We, we had the, this little home, uh, that we would stay in during the winter, during the summers, we'd be up in the mountains. Uh, dad was trying to, it was actually, I call him my dad, but he was my, my, I was raised by a stepfather, the father of my three sisters. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, he was trying to get back into logging, which is a lot of what we did in Northern California, uh, cutting wood and stuff. And then we got into to mining, um, and my parents just were they were they were interesting people. So uh, my stepfather, my mother, my father uh, were all like really really intelligent, well read people, but definitely like uh, hippies, just not wanting to be part of society whatsoever. 
Um, my dad, he was a member of Mensa. Um, my stepdad was a, he was a musician, artist of sorts, and incredibly high IQ. I know he was actually significantly higher than my father's, but he just couldn't function in society. And uh, my mom kind of like created all the plans and did everything. And my mother was the same thing. She was uh, graduated from a high school of like 1,500 people. She won the student athlete award. She had, you know, she she was going to school to be a uh, a chemist when I was uh, when I was born. And uh, finally, just she just decided she didn't want to. It's not much around like people, <laughs> and so so uh, she she pretty much chose the life that uh, that we lived, and she's lived it on her own terms. Uh, um, for quite some time, still does today. She lives out in the, out in the boonies, uh, mining and just kind of barely making ends meet. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was just a really interesting, you know, cause everybody thinks if you talk about growing up, they're essentially homeless, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there was, there was times, like I said, we'd have houses, we'd be maybe a condemned house with like no doors, no, like literally nothing but, you know, wood walls, just the outer walls, no windows, that sort of thing of something that'd been lived in before or just a tiny cabin um no water no electricity um we lived in a number of those in uh in oregon actually um there were like hunting cabins basically but that was our that was our winter home our good home mm-hmm. <laughs> when we weren't like, right, in right. the trailer or the tents and um and so it was uh yeah it was just interesting because you you say hey i grow up homeless and people think oh you know poor uneducated all that and uh, where, in fact, like we were constant. Con- I mean, we'd go down and to the library, you know, every couple weeks, and just stacks of books, researching things. That's how we got into mining was uh, research in geology and just bearing through all the literature. And then, like, let's get in the field and like start finding this stuff ourselves. And uh, so it was, you know, definitely high level of discussion, high level of reading, like all this stuff going on. Just you know, while you're while we're reading by candle lights or flashlights because that's what we had wow you uh, saw they they made that movie of y'all captain fantastic i watched that movie and i really really struggled getting through it i probably cried several times so really? it really struck a little too close to home um sure man so um there's definitely just a lot more um chaos in my upbringing because honestly right. living in the woods you run on into people that are hiding from society as well and yep. sometimes it's not because like my parents who just didn't want to be part of society it's people that needed to hide from society and next thing you know you find hey the guy camping a mile down the road that we've been hanging out with is a murderer hey how, uh, how did I've you discover a, that uh, um so um, I think he, uh, in that instance, uh, he had uh, let my stepfather know, like after they'd been drinking buddies for, for a while. And wow. uh, so the uh, uh, one day we, we all hitched a ride into town. Actually, there's a few different interesting stories about that mountain living. Um, so we, we all hung out in town for the day, and I didn't know why. And we... Uh, uh, that evening we went back up to the mountain and, uh, parents are like, Oh, by the way, um, that guy that up, was up the road, he, the police came in and arrested him and took him to jail because he murdered somebody, you know, 10 years ago, um, beat him mm-hmm. to death with a tire iron because he, they owed him, he, he, he was owed $20 Holy and, shit. uh, you know, it's like, Hmm, interesting. So we happened to be in town while that was happening on the day the police happened. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, basically my parents like turned him in. Yeah. <laughs> and once they found out, they're like, uh, yeah, because uh, that, that, yeah, just how it works. So, um, and, uh, yeah, a funny story, um, while we lived there, uh, same spot. This is, uh, we, we were actually, we lived by a rattlesnake den. So we had, uh, uh, poles like strapped up to the trees and then, you know, with branches hung between them. Uh, so our Mm. beds were up there, you know, elevated off the ground. So we didn't get any snakes at at night. And, uh, my second sister was actually born. So it was me my brother and my, uh, and one of my sisters were living there. And then my mom was pregnant 
and uh, we didn't have a car. And so she went into labor, and so she has to hike out to the the, the holy. She shit. has to hike out to the gravel road, <laughs> and wait till somebody drives by, which happened to be a dump truck. She, I don't know why they didn't let her in the cab, but she climbed into the bed of the dump truck, and was driven into town and driven to the the hospital uh, emergency room, and climbs out of the dump truck bed, goes into the hospital, oh and births my, births my sister. So. Uh, my mom's a tough, tough, tough cookie. So um, <laughs> my strength is, you know, everybody always likes to say, you know, uh, strength is uh, because of all the work I did, right? You can't negate that. But, you know, top level, if you want to be anybody that's world class has worked for it, but they've also had some level of genetics, right? And my, uh, my strength genetics and, uh, and work ethic definitely came from, from my mother's side. So. Wow. She's uh she's she's a tough woman. So. <laughs> Jesus, man. That's insane. So so what happens next? You're you're I don't know, you're eight, nine, ten years old at this point. Oh, so uh yeah, so we, we ended up in Oregon um after the parents got us back. And um uh, I'm not gonna throw every I'm not throwing all the stories in here, by the way. I think I've told you my my memoir is coming out, but uh there's a there's a maybe a pedophile ring and a serial killer and a few other things that go on through the Jesus. through the years. And these are just so, these are just people that that you've come across in the mountains or had to deal with. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh. So, um, so um, um, so I ended up uh, doing so to get you know just living that life, uh, bouncing around, and we get to to high school and uh my my stepfather uh actually had a broken arm this whole time uh for the last like 15 years and that he'd been fighting a disability suit for so he's been logging with literally a break in his arm which has grown to like a half of an inch gap now imagine running oh a chainsaw with a with the bone broken right and they're just rubbing against each other and uh so he finally wins this you know like his workers comp claim or whatever it was and uh, gets a gets a small payout, but mostly gets the surgery paid for. So he gets in, gets his arm, uh, you know, they carve a big chunk of uh, bone out of his leg and put it in his arm. Damn. And uh, but we make a down payment on a small uh, mobile home. So this is like going into freshman year of high school is the first like stable stable point in my life, right? And I've got a home, um, but it's. It's not like what most people would consider. You know, there was no there was no doors in the inside the house at all, right? Mm-hmm. So we hung up sheets. There was no kitchen, so we took some two by fours and some some plywood and slapped together some counters and threw everything on the floor under the counters. And uh, did you feel did you feel like you were rich? Oh, at yeah. that point, oh, yeah, I felt it was awesome, man. Like this was like uh, I had a bedroom. Like we had electricity and heat and running Amazing. water and like. Uh, because uh, it's a mobile home, I had a little extension built off the side that I'm sure wasn't a code. Um, fire department actually burnt the place down uh, many years later because it wasn't uh, livable uh, after wow. we no longer inhabited it. But um, so, <clears throat> uh, yeah, we move in there like my freshman year of, of of high school. So all through high school was to me absolutely great. Like I had stable place to live, um, and I'd been working on the side. You know. When we were mining, I was always helping my parents, uh, which is hard, hard physical labor. So people always ask me when I started training. I'm like, well, I was hiking up hills with 200 pounds of rocks on my back at, you know, 13 years old. So I'm like, that's probably when my training started. <laughs> yep. yep. But uh, I started lifting weights in junior high. And then uh, in high school, you know, I was, I was working, um, uh, you know, had my own kind of like lawn care business I, I, I did. Uh, and I put all the money towards buying weight equipment, and I put it out on the back, uh, the the back deck uh, behind the mobile home, and and that's when I started. Uh, that's when I really started uh, lifting weights, and started doing sports and all that sort of stuff. So high school was a pretty pretty good experience for me in that regard. I mean, like I still didn't see myself fitting in with everybody, you know. My, um, but I, you know, especially once I got my driver's license and could start working. Um, you know, things were even better because I could buy my own clothes. I could, you know, do all that, do all that sort of stuff. But 
but most of my money, or maybe not most, but a lot of it still went back to the family. So that's just something that, you know, I felt as part of, you know, that's what needed to be done. Um, so it was uh, a lot of it, yeah, would go go that direction. So it was like a pretty busy schedule for me in high school. So it was like school, sports, and then, you know, a drive to the, to the resort that was a half hour away uh, to work after that and work on the weekends. And uh, that was, so it was, it was busy, but it was just, I was used to work at this point and just putting in the time and uh, ended up doing pretty good in, in, in high school. Um, I, I graduated as valid Victorian. Um, no shit. I was second in state as a wrestler, um, did a lot of other sports as well and was pretty, pretty decent. I just didn't understand specificity. So I ran the 100, the 3000, the 800 did, did cross country <laughs> through shot put. Like there was, I did everything in between, so I was moderately good, like at everything, but mm-hmm. not exceptional at any one thing, just because I didn't understand training concepts. Hey, uh, man, we'll 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 take you over here in CrossFit. <laughs> Sounds like you excel. So, but uh, wrestling was definitely my thing. So, like, uh, um, I was uh, pretty pretty good in that field. I, I ended up losing to the three time state champion, but uh, wow. I I should have beat him. It was I I I, I lost. That was. So anyway, uh, let me ask you this: Did you did you have a good relationship with, like, a positive relationship with your parents? It's uh, it's a strained relationship. So it's just it's difficult to understand. Um, there's definitely so after I uh, after I went to college, uh, my mom had a, a mental breakdown and basically left, and uh, so she ended up out in Montana somewhere for a number of years and my three younger sisters were at home with their father who like I said my mom kind of directed him he was an incredibly talented man but like he was crazy and uh I could tell you lots of stories that would reinforce that but like you know my my little sister you know she's 13 years old I think maybe at the time and it's this is uh central Oregon you know it gets between one to up to four feet of snow during the winter, right? So mm-hmm. let's say there's a, it's on the low end, there's a foot of snow on the ground. And he is convinced that she stole his favorite cereal bowl. So he kicks her out with no possessions, nothing, just the clothes on her back. And 13 years old, and not like for an hour, like, you know, like you're kicked out, go find a, go find a place to live, go figure it out. Wow. Um, you know, because his favorite cereal bowl is missing, which it turns out he lost. It was like high on top of the fridge or something like that. So, oh, God. But anyway, he, he, he's crazy. And uh, so I'm getting into the relationship thing here. I'm just mm-hmm. giving some background, little little, sure. little stories. So um, anyway, all my sisters end up like living on their own, um, not in good places. And I ended up having to take custody of uh, all three of them uh, and raising them. Uh, through their through their teenage years, from like fourteen or fifteen, depending on the one, up through uh, eighteen or nineteen, depending on when they moved out, it varied on each of them. And uh, so, yeah, I was pretty disappointed with my mother, you know, at that at that. But over the years afterwards, like my sisters forgave her, so I figured if they forgave her, then I'm fine because I was really upset for them, not necessarily myself. And uh, when my so we've got a good relationship now. It's just it's just different. You've got a, you know, and she's an alcoholic. I mean, you don't call afternoon because you can't understand what she says. Um, you know, that's just that's just life and things that you deal with. But we we, we manage as a family the best that uh, the best that we can. I have a really 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 close relationship with all three of my sisters, obviously. So it's kind of a father figure and brother relationship because essentially. I, one, I, I was the one, you know, raising them for, you know, through, you know, kind of some key years of their life for them. But, you know, in reflection, I realized why things fell apart when I moved out, because I was actually part of the stabilizing force of the family, keeping it together, and had really done a lot in basically raising my sisters, while my parents had been out doing the things that they did when we were living in the woods. Um, And uh, so, 
So I really had a, a I've got a really close connection with them. Um, our stepfather uh, and my father, uh, it's, it's just, it's just interesting. It's, uh, you, you have somebody that loves you so much, right? But they have created so much pain and scarring in you and your sibling's life that it's, it's hard to understand and mix those emotions together. Um, so my, uh, my stepfather is, he's passed on and, um, but, uh, my, my, my youngest of my sisters actually spread his ashes a few years ago. And, uh, he was always a constant, uh, he was a very happy man, jovial, a prankster. Um, his literary stuff was just hilarious. And, uh, like I said, he was, that's where he fell was on the, that artistic side. And, uh, mm -hmm. but there's so many mixed emotions. And so my sister, he hated the snow. He hated winter. So my sister works ski resorts and she went up on one of the mountains and went to the, the darkest backside, coldest area and spread his ashes off the back of the mountain to show that she loved him. But yeah. also that like, ha ha, here's what you hate. Like, you know, it's just like, you're going to forever live in this, you know, <laughs> as a, as, is is a, is an ongoing prank to him. Uh, prank, prank in the pranks. It's, 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 prank, it's a prank, but it's also, it, it shows that mixed emotions. Like mm -hmm. I, I hate you and you've hurt me, but I love you. And I don't understand how you could have loved us so much, but he just wasn't functional in life. And, mm -hmm. uh, my father, um, kind of the same thing. Like, um, he was an incredibly intelligent man. Uh, he never really worked, so he had a uh, he had severe depression, uh, so much so that he couldn't hold a job, and so he had disability uh, from the state for for that. And I mean, he he did a lot of volunteer work because he loved doing that. He was a very religious man. Um, spent three years in Tibet with the monks and stuff like that. Like he's pretty, uh, he's an interesting fella, but, um, I, I just think of him and my father, my stepfather and think about how much like talent and intelligence they had, but literally they left the world. Nothing like when they died, it was, you know, that, uh, that classic, uh, Kansas song, dust in the wind, like, mm -hmm. you know, there was, they left no, nobody, nobody knew of their passings except for their kids in my, in my father's case, me. And, you know, um, and there was no mark left on the world. There was no, like it was gone. And what they did leave was people that were also, it wasn't even this huge, like positive thing. It was a, a, a bag of mixed emotions. Like, I don't understand our relationship right. and these other things. Like, that's all that was left. And, uh, that, that, uh, became a pretty, a powerful thing for me. Like for me, I, I'm like, I, I, I can't have that ever happen. I am going to leave the mark on the world. I'm going to leave a positive legacy for my kids. I'm going to make the world a better place for me mm -hmm. having been in it. And, and that's, that's what, that's what my father and my stepfather left me with is, is, right. is really that, but yeah. Wow, man. And the interesting thing is that they also, they also, I'm sure played a role in a lot of your positive qualities. It sounds like there were incredible discussions. Uh, they taught you to be strong amongst, amongst other things. Um, uh, I picked up this this verbiage in the last couple of years um, of kind of thanking our parents for everything they were and everything they were not. And I think despite all of their flaws, our parents are, they're trying to do the best they can with the knowledge that they have. Um, as crazy as that may seem sometimes. It, 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 I, I agree. And it's, uh, you know, it sounds like I'm, I'm bashing them, but I'm not. It's, this is just the reality of the situation. Sure. And um, it, it's just, I thought nothing of it really growing up. I just like, this is the way things are. 
Um, but when I got older, like in my, you know, mid thirties, I have my own kids. Like that's when I really started reflecting on it. And I'm like, wow, I wouldn't trade my life for anything. Cause we're talking about going from that to being like a corporate level executive doing company turnarounds and then walking away from that before the time I'm 30, 40 to like, you know, do what I'm doing now just because it's my passion project. Yep. Um, and, uh, it's, <clears throat> They've definitely built the the strength in my character to do that, um, without a doubt. Um, that's a big, you know, big part of my philosophy is that, you know, everything in life should only, you know, strength is a good thing. And people think about strength physically, but we need to think about strength, you know, emotionally, um, spiritually, like all these things. And the stronger you are, the more resilient you're going to be. And they definitely, they definitely taught me that. I mean, it wasn't uh, a lot of the life that they lived was was chosen, and I wouldn't. That's why I said I, I brought up the me being in my thirties and having my kids. I wouldn't trade my life for anything, but oh my god, I would. It it makes me so sad thinking about like when I look at my kids, thinking about them having to endure some of the stuff that I went through growing up. Right, right. Um, you know, to watch your literally watch your family members die off around you watch your friends die um you know it at a young age and my father like he attempted suicide seven times over the course of his life uh, i i witnessed at least once of the, one of them it's a young child you know imagine watching your dad come to pick you up from the from the bus station and he's wearing the same clothes that he's worn for two weeks straight with the that he hasn't even taken off to go to the bathroom you know coming you know wandering down because he's been just in a severe depression and drinking and, you mm -hmm. know, just like that's some fucked up shit like yep. <laughs> to deal with yep. when you're like just a child, you know? Right. And, uh, uh, yeah, that's, I, like I said, I'd trade it for nothing. I can't, I can't imagine anything other than the life I've had, but man, man, it just, you could, it's just so emotional, like thinking about those experiences and then thinking about your own children having to, having to deal with that. And I'm like, I just, I can't imagine that. I can't imagine it either. How, how have you learned to cope emotionally? Uh, it sounds like you didn't, you weren't supported maybe at all in that, in that like part of your life. How have you learned to cope with emotions and I don't know, prop yourself up and take care of yourself? That's a good question. And I've been struggling with that one for a long time. Uh, I, I honestly don't know where I came from out of this. Like, I didn't really have a mentor or anyone that kind of provided me direction. I think the one thing that I had was uh, survivor mentality. Mm -hmm. So because I was the one responsible for others at a young age, I think that's what helped me together and kept me like my emotions stable uh, because I knew I had to be there for my siblings. And it's there, there was no fallback plan. There's no... You know, if things don't go well for me or I lose a job or whatever, like I've got a I've got a couch or a, a home I can go home to like th that's there was nothing for me. Like it's all on me to succeed. And I've got people counting on me. And um, so for me in my younger years, it was just head down, work your ass off. So like when I was 21 years old, I, I still have my senior project left to do in my engineering curriculum. But I basically finished in three years my entire engineering curriculum. Um, and was just a couple credits shy of having two engineering degrees, owned my own house, owned my own business, uh, was working full time in the field that I was going to, you know, that my degree was in and raising and raising the first of my, actually I had my first, the first of my three sisters then. And I might've by 22, I think is when I took the second one in and, uh, it was just head down, man, just head down uh, working. And then I've always fought depression, so the depression thing runs in the family. Um, mm -hmm. My uh, my father's mother Likewise. blew her head off with a shotgun, and her brother jumped out a window. You know, he was a business guy, jumped out of a window someplace downtown San Francisco. So on. Yeah. The story goes on. I'm the only only person in. Well, actually, no, my uh, my kids are now. So I was the last in the line. <laughs> yeah, but um, so you know, I always fought depression my you know my whole life, and. Uh, but outside of that, like it wasn't until I started getting older that 
and like I said, and started reflecting. So this is in my 30s in the last 10 years that like it started really hitting me emotionally when I think about that stuff and those experiences. And as I'm working through it, as I'm working on my book, like it's like, wow, this is this is intense. And I never experienced it growing up, you know. So I think it was really that survivor mentality. And um, I went through a I went through a divorce uh, uh a couple years back, and uh, so I, I was seeing a counselor at the time because um, it was, you know, on top of the depression and other stuff, it was really, really, really hard on me, and I'm sure it is on everybody. And uh, so we're going through, like, all my past experiences and then, like, how you rate on certain scales, and he's like, I don't, literally, my, my psychologist says to me, I don't understand. And I'm like, what, what? And he's like, I don't understand how you're either not in jail, not a drug yeah. addict, or not dead. He's like, I just don't understand. Like, you have so much of like everything that everything that bad could happen has mm-hmm. has touched your life at some point in time on on the scales that they measure everything on. And um, and uh, I'm like, I, I I don't know. Like like how did I end up the path? Like I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. You know, I graduated college just like having the highest engineering GPA. Um, you know, I. I don't know. I don't know where the drive really came from in the direction so early on because I, there wasn't anybody really guiding that. And it's just got to be, again, that survivor head in, head down mentality. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, my parents were great, but they weren't really parents in the mentoring fashion <laughs> by any means. Sure. And uh, so, so yeah, that's that's kind of a a, a, a you know a, a a riddle to me, I guess. And, you know, how I deal with it now, like, uh, a lot of it is, you know, the, the book is like a big cathartic process for me right now. So it's it's been a lot of work. Uh, it's releasing in May. And um, there's just, I love the fact that I've, I've done short story pieces on, uh, on a few pieces and talked about my life in a number of podcasts. And uh, it's just really rewarding sharing it and hearing back from people that literally I'll get emails like, hey, you saved my life. Like I was going to commit suicide and, you know, I didn't. Or, hey, I didn't know where I was going. Like things were really bad. You inspired me to launch my own business or, you know, so on and on and on. And uh, that is just really rewarding. And so that's why that's why I have become more comfortable with with sharing it uh, openly. There's still a lot of pieces that have not never been shared publicly um, that will only be coming out in the book that will really kind of tie all that together. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think I lost my train of thought there a little bit. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, I love it. Um, I, I've come to really believe that our darkest times are our biggest teachers and that's really what kind of shapes our character Mm -hmm. and man you had some fucking dark times you had some incredibly dark times and it's not it's not surprising to me that you have such a strong character what are some of the things that you got from your upbringing that you think you're now using to your advantage yeah very good question so um one of those is what I, I went through on the outset, right? So it is, you know, taking that that self-actualization, basically. That, that'd be the term for it. But, like, you know, realizing you have control and deciding who you want to be. Like, right now, the person you're talking to, these are stories I'm telling you. And they're just as much for you hearing them is like me hearing them. Because it's not who – it's not – those stories are not who I am. They may have played a role in kind of shaping my philosophy and stuff like that, but I, I chose to be who become who I am today, and and, uh, and and I'm proud of that. And anyone can do that. And so it's like not letting your circumstances and your environment become a definition of who you are. Another one I love to spend time on is prioritization, and I see this over and over again where people just like let life live them. They let tasks and think like I want to feel somebody may want to feel busy and feel like they're doing mm-hmm. a bunch of stuff we see this in work so this is a a big thing on the business mm-hmm. side of things because um, they'll come in and people or organizations will just be so busy doing stuff and uh, you know take a step back and go okay if you've if you've done the piece of deciding who you want to be or where you're going 
analyze everything that you're doing and figure out, is it moving me in that path? And you'll realize that most everything that you do every day is not. <laughs> Yes. And, and so like I would come in that, you know, they'd hire me to come in and transform a company, you know, like get it, uh, you know, improved and, and sold or, you know, and I would go in and do nothing. Literally, like I take over for people that, you know, the previous general manager, director, whatever it was lurking 12, 16 hour days, busting their ass, running reports, doing this, running around with their hair on fire. And this is, I tell a business story cause it's life, it's the same life you do the same process with your life as well, and I'll give some examples there. But you'll find that, like, okay, I'm not going to do anything, and I'm going to think about where this company's going, what its needs are, and almost always, like, all these reports, all this stuff is just, like, just fluff. Data is important, but what's important is that you're taking action off of it. So the most important thing in life is the action. What actions are you taking that are moving you a step closer every day? And you may not, you may not actually be able to feel that step every day, or you may be taking the steps for a year before you even feel like you've made some progress. But know whether the steps are moving you there, you mm -hmm. know. Like, and uh, so for me, like in the business world, I found that you know the the most important thing was actually getting everybody engaged in like. What's the common goal in making the cultural shift in the organization? And it actually just came down to having small conversations every day with people and telling them where we're going and how they fit in and what they were needing and like all the other actual work. So you do that conversation. It doesn't, you know, from the outside, it looks like you're just like doing nothing. You're not like in your office typing, you know, typing up an email or doing the other, you know, any of that other stuff, that other stuff doesn't do anything that's actually moving it forward. Mm -hmm. But that does. And that ended up like completely transforming entire organizations, changing profitability, taking, taking um, performance metrics to a world-class level. And, you know, that it, it's all done in those. So you got to understand what the important pieces is. Like every day in your life, you know, what do you do when you go home? Are you clicking on the TV? Um, you know, watching the game on Sunday, having beers with your buddies on Friday night. I'm not saying that you don't have, you know, fun time, but how many people that just fall into the rut of doing that stuff on a regular basis? Can you guess if I had a TV growing up? No. I'm guessing not unless you were plugging into like a, a stream, like one of those uh, like windmills or something like that. <laughs> so... Uh, actually, I had a little battery-powered one for a little while, and then like on the holidays, we'd go rent a VCR and like 15 movies, like for Christmas. And <laughs> nice. uh, so, so that was like the treat, like Thanksgiving and Christmas was mm. we'd catch up on all the movies that were released for the year, um, <laughs> go rent everything, and you know. But uh, it, you know, while I went to college, in the years following college, while I, while I advanced my career, got my MBA, did all that stuff, I have a TV. What value is that adding for me, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not saying not to not to have a TV, but th that's that's kind of the that, that's kind of the point. Like, what is what are the things that are moving you forward? And you'll realize there's a lot of stuff that's not, and we fall into the routine. And I call it letting life live you. You're just falling into the routine yep. of doing tasks. So this yep. is what's called prioritization. So the first thing that you do in my world of prioritization is nothing. You do nothing and then figure out what you have to do. And boom. And, and then, it's badass. Yeah, exactly. Strip everything out of your life. Okay. I'm going to go to the gym and go to work and I'm going to do nothing else and see what comes to me that I have to do. Okay. But do those same things with the gym and work too, by the way. So now, yeah, what do I have? Yeah. Now, what do I have to do? And then the next step is okay, I figured out what has to be done. How do I automate it? How do I make it so that I don't have to do it? You know, set up your online bill pay, whatever it is. You know, there's some easy, that's a, a nice, easy example. But, you know, just like how do I automate these tasks so that I don't have to do anything if possible? Now, if I can't automate it, so first one is get rid of it, right? Because that's in the do nothing stage. So if it doesn't come back to you, don't fucking do it. <laughs> Number two, automate it. Number three is, okay, now I figure out if I can delegate it, you know. Um, so... You know, the, that, that's just a, a, a good thing in life is making sure you've got priorities. But first, tying priorities to goals. 
And, and then with goals, really understanding before you establish your goals, you've got to understand what are, what's important to you in life? What are your values? Okay. Cause I, I hate this. People love to just make random goals. Yep. I see this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go skydiving. I, I got my bucket list of 20 things that I'm going to like, okay. How does that tie together? What is that? What does that work with? So you got to start with like, what are my values? Like, do I want to feel financially stable? That's an important thing to me in life is, you know, uh, spirituality. Where's that at? Where's, you know, what, what are these, it doesn't matter. Anybody can, like I said, I, I use the financial stability because everybody wants to talk about, um, you know, being rich is, you know, like not a great goal. Well, for some people it is, they don't feel secure. They don't feel comfortable. Um, so I had the conversation recently, you talk about, uh, you know, some people's like, they have a vision of like, I want to have a fast car and a great mansion and do this stuff. Okay. Those are goals. Why do you want those? Mm-hmm. Oh, I want them because I don't feel secure unless I have, you know, financial security. And those would show me that I'm financially secure. So they're not the output. And so you're starting with an output and not understanding why you want it. Cause there could be so many other ways to get there and actually get what you want if you really understand it. So the bar it, might, the bar that you're shooting for might actually be way lower. It might, it might be, help you get there faster knowing that. Exactly. So you start with values and then from there you go, okay, what are some goals that I can create that will fit and help me realize what I want out of those? And then you start working on, okay, how do I change my prioritization in my life to manage this? And uh, all of a sudden you'll find that you've got, you can make vast changes in your life and people always mess me like, how do you get so much shit done? Because I have – everything I do has to be world-class. Mm-hmm. So if it's my work, if it's my hobbies, if it's my training, and guess what? They all are world-class. And some people, how the fuck do you do this? You, you just run in, you know, 24 hours a day? Like, no, that's not the case. Actually, I nap every day. Like, that's a, like, you know, like, I, 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 sl- I sleep nine hours a night. I take a nap in the middle of the day. Like, it, you don't have to be running fast on task because we get caught up. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting back to the, we get caught up in these tasks and stuff, and it makes you feel like you're accomplishing shit. But guess right. what? You're accomplishing shit. So, yeah. Anyway, I, I think a I good, went off a on a tangent to... with your with your question there, but oh, it's awesome! It, man. It's it's some some good nuggets for for life, right? Yeah, one way to really tune into this, guys, and know if this applies to you is if you've ever said some version of, "Oh, I'm, I'm so busy, but it's good." <laughs> yes, that, that's quite that's quintessential, and and I've been there, and I wore it like a badge of honor. And people do and... that, like I'm especially like the entrepreneur, like that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. like I'm. Yeah, I'm busy. This is good. I'm cranking. I'm cranking. Well, it may not be good. Like, is it, you know? Yep. Yeah. And I, I love what you said about figuring out what you value. And then in terms of your pri- prioritization, I've never heard a better definition of it. R- strip everything away and then figure out what do I need to move towards what I deeply value. Yep. Great place to start. Great yeah. place to start. That worked great in me for business too, because that you come in and people tell you all this sort of stuff that you have to do. And obviously you can't do this with every position because I was in a, you know, executive level positions. If you don't do anything, the thing that keeps coming back and getting hounded on, it's like, okay, I need to do this one. But you'll find there's 10 other things that just happen to land on and somebody said they are going to do it, but it's creating something that goes somewhere, does nothing, gets filed away. Like you'll be, you'll be blown away about how much stuff is just like, self-created tasks and do that with the people that work for you. You'll find that there's, it, it just goes on and on and on. We love yep. to create work yep. and uh, it, it's, it's, it's easy. Cause if you don't understand where you're going, it's all the same. But once you understand where you're going, it, it becomes much clearer. Right. And you stop. And then when you stop wasting time on things that don't line up with those core values, then you start sprinting like people see you doing. Exactly. Exactly. You nailed that. So now I (laughs) now I just want to I want I want to tease him a little bit because we're about to end this first one. Yep. And I want to tease him a little bit because we haven't even mentioned you deadlifting. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know, Chris is one of the strongest men in 
history. And as far as I know, you're the only person to have ever deadlifted a thousand pounds for a double. Yes, that is correct. Uh, and, uh, there's only, well, there's six other people that have now deadlifted a thousand plus pounds. Right. And they're yep. all 400 pounds strong men, right. Or four plus, I think three, I think the lightest was a 380, three, 380 pounder. So I deadlifted, um, a thousand and two pounds for almost a triple. Didn't lock out the last one weighing 260 pounds. So lightest person to by over a hundred pounds to ever deadlift a thousand pounds. Uh, <laughs> only person to ever do reps with over a thousand pounds. And uh, I did this with a sumo stance, which nobody is ever, it's the only, so this is the Guinness book of world records, uh, sumo, sumo deadlift. Um, and it's not just deadlift. I love, I love exploring like human potential. Mm-hmm. So uh, all the stuff that I do now, so I used to be a competitive power lifter, um, but when I decided to kind of forge my own path, I decided to do that on everything. So I don't play by anybody's rules, but my own. So I just do what I want to do. And uh, so all my lifting events, uh, just I call myself an exhibition lifter now, uh, are for some sort of charity cause. And so the most recent one that we did uh, was childhood cancer awareness. My business partner uh, has a grand uh, grandson uh, fighting uh, cancer right now. Um, so we partnered with Alex's Lemonade Stand. If you aren't familiar with them, check them out. Um, or you can see it on our website. Uh, so if you go to actually the website for the fundraiser is 880 every day, 880 every day. I deadlifted 880 pounds. So a, a weight that only a few people in the world can do. This is, a, you know, c- close to world record level deadlift. I did it every single day for 16 days straight. And I tell you what, there, and I'll, I'll say this confidently, no one else in the world can do this. So this is a combination of not just strength, but, you know, robustness, recovery, like all the things have to come into play, which we can get into in the next episode uh, because there's so much that comes into play with that. Uh, one of the most famous deadlifters, he actually just died like two weeks ago, uh, Constantine, Constant, I can't remember, I can never pronounce his, he's known as KK. He's one of the greatest deadlifters of all time. And uh, he talked about uh, one of his tough years. His tough year was because he had 20 sessions where over the course of a year where he deadlifted 400 kilo, 880 pounds uh, in those sessions. So he did it 20 times in a year. I did it 16 times in 16 days. So uh, earlier. What happened on the 17th? uh, Well, 16th day, I actually uh, tore my hamstring. So, you know, Okay. (laughs) (laughs) at that point, so I was discovering, I'm I'm discovering what human potential is there, right? So at that point, it just, the. I had so much inflammation going on my body, like it was kind of crazy, um, but uh, yeah, it just it just just went. So um, I'm about 100 percent now. It was that was last month. Uh, earlier this year, I squatted. Uh, this was for the Special Olympics, 800 pounds every single day for 30 days straight. Jesus. Again, I don't think anybody can do that. And uh, if anybody wants to try, go for it. So. Um, and so I've got a lot of other, uh, you know, I used to be a you know, record-holding power lifter. You know, I was ranked number one in the world for eight years straight, and some lifter or another. Um, I competed for 16 years or so. Um, had a world, uh, one of the best squats by any uh, weight class. So uh, it was the heaviest four times body weight squat in the world at the time. Uh, 881 pounds at uh, 220 pound body weight. Mother and uh, I've done other feats of strength. I did the I squatted 500 pounds for uh, 23 reps, I believe, in 60 seconds. Um, I deadlifted 405. So both of these were like Guinness records at the time. Uh, they've since been beat. 405 pounds uh, for um, it was like 42 reps in 60 seconds. And then, Jesus. Uh, actually, my best though in for endurance rep stuff, I did. Uh, so I did 675 pounds for 20 reps straight in one set, uh, sumo. And then I turned back around and did 10 more conventional. I could have done 20, but I had to go puke in the sink to, to <laughs> stop. Me. So, have, have you ever heard of a Festivus party? <laughs> uh, no. Seinfeld. Oh yeah. <laughs> You're on my team. <laughs> Fe- the feats of strength is one of the events there. Yeah. 
So I, yeah, I just, I, I love it. Man. And I love being able to explore like other things like recovery, work capacity, all that sort of stuff. Uh, not just like, Hey, what's the maximal lift that you can do? Right. So right on, man. Yeah. So I want to, I want to dive into your career as an athlete and then what you're building at Kabuki, Kabuki strength. Is that how you say it? Kabuki? Yep. Kabuki strength on this next episode, uh, before we get out of here, what's something that really worries you that's going on in the world right now? Mm. Just the polarization. Um, just, we see so many people becoming so entrenched in, and I think it's just because of, uh, social media, online, everything. I think there's fan absolutely fantastic things going around. Cause like, I can reach people around the world with my messages, our products that help people. But we also see just like extremism in viewpoints and people becoming so, you know, in these camps. Uh, and I'm not just talking political. Like we see it across the board. People want to argue about, oh, I'm in this philosophy. We can't, we can't, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to look at your training style because it's that philosophy. And, you know, it's like, you know, if you actually talk to anybody that's good, Everybody's there's an always it's a depends. Tell me more. Let's you know, but we we see so many people that are getting caught up where there there's just no discussion anymore. It's it's just it's just anger. It's just butting heads. It's just and this isn't good. This is not good as a whole. And we like I said mm -hmm. it. It's easy for people to think about this as a you know if I'm as I'm saying it as more of a political thing, but it's it's across the board. I mean we can see it. We see it in people arguing about nutrition and <laughs> training and the, the stuff that uh, that we play a role in, right? Um, so, and this isn't this is this is not a good thing. Um, it can't be just uh, you know it's nothing is that black and white. And when we get right. there, we stop learning and we stop growing, and that's the most important thing. What happens? What is not learning and not growing? It's not getting stronger. It's not living a better life. As humans, we only grow from three things, um, and that's adap adaptation, okay? So we grow by adapting to stress. So that means we need to be challenged mentally, <laughs> physically, and emotionally to be able to adapt, and that's strength, and that's what I call living better through strength um, because strength is the process of growing, and if, we've, if, we're, if we're in this state, we're, we're, no, longer, we're no longer growing. So that's that's the long road road to uh, or the short road to atrophy and death, right? Right, right. So, so what's something that really excites you right now? Uh, what really excites me is just the level of knowledge. Like, um, so in the in the strength training and movement world, just the 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 amount that we know, and now the the kind of the collaboration across like. Uh, you know, clinical research to, you know, practice and actually putting things into place in the, the sports performance world, uh, getting people, you know, in positions and moving in a manner that that's the, it allows them to express their full uh, potential, but at the same time is minimizing injury, all this sort of stuff. Like I, I, I think back on what we teach and I go, man, if I had only known this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I wouldn't be beat up and broken like I am now. God, that'd be so amazing. I got to beat myself up for not knowing this stuff. I'm like, oh, wait, it wasn't there. I can't beat right. myself. Like, we're pulling it together and getting it out there. Um, but that. You could hit it for a set of 10, man. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, I just find it so exciting uh, because for so long, uh, streak training has kind of been a hit or miss, whether it's been detrimental or positive. And, uh, we've got so much knowledge and expertise and then, uh, a ability to get that information out to people in reach. Now on the counter of that, there's so much other crap information. So, you know, but, but, but it's there and it's happening. Like, you know, I, 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 I work with top sports teams in the world. Um, I work with the best clinical researchers, like, and just like flowing all the way through that and seeing the interconnectedness and where it's going and what the outputs of that is just, it's, it's just amazing. And it really excites me. Hell yeah, man. Chris, you've got an incredible story, brother. Thank you for sharing all the, uh, 
you know, all your childhood and everything that, everything that you went through and you are an inspiration to say the least, my man. Well, it's been a pleasure getting on here and being able to uh, tell a little bit of the stories with you and look forward to, uh, taking the discussion a little further next, next time. Right on, man. Where can people keep up with you personally? And then where can they find out more about your company? So company is just kabuki strength.com K A B U K I. If you type it into Google, we're probably going to be the first thing that top pops up. Um, and so we're on all the social media platforms. Uh, well, okay. Well, uh, uh, in, How many are there now? <laughs> exactly. I've said uh, that's that's a lie because, <laughs> uh, but you know, Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, Twitter, LinkedIn, all that sort of stuff. Most of the stuff is uh, is on our YouTube or Instagram. Uh, we publish artic- We got articles going out every day on my Facebook. Um, so my 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 name on uh, on Instagram is uh, Mad Scientist Duffin. There's an underscore between each of those words. Should be links on the website. Kabuki Strength has all its own ones as well. Um, uh, Facebook, uh, Coach Chris Duffin. Um, anyway, it should be all pretty easy. If you just type my name into Google or Kabuki into Google, it's all going to pop up. So, Word. You the man, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Hey, guys. Over the past five to 10 years, there's been a huge explosion in the number of options in training programs for the sport of fitness. And because there are so many options, it can be really confusing picking the best one for you. So a couple years ago, I created a guide to specifically to help you pick the right training program to meet your needs and to fit your lifestyle. Uh, In this guide, I go over how to avoid the biggest programming mistake that I see people making, five costly misconceptions about program programming, training methods that work best, three mistakes to avoid when choosing a training program, the importance of value and price, and then finally, four steps to reaching your potential. And this is a free guide. This is something specifically just to help you find what's best for you. And you can get this by going to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash P-Y-P. That's brutestrengthtraining.com backslash P-Y-P. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.